Oh, uh, oh, 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 Nagasaki City. Oh. I mean, where in Nagasaki City do you know? Oh, what do oh, Shiroyama Machi, do you know? Ah, mm, yes, yes, near, of course. Near, near the uh, Urakami uh, Cathedral. Yes. Mm -hmm. Near the Hypo Center. Yes. yes, yes. So, but we live in Canada, Toronto, yes. right now. Yes. yes. So glad you're with us tonight. Sorry? I am so glad that you are here oh. with us tonight. Oh, thank you. Thank you. Uh, right now, my husband, Ted Starrow, and our son are with, with us. <laughs> oh, wow. So, yeah. yeah. <laughs> so we are so happy to see you, <laughs> to hear your story. Thank, thank you. Thank you so much. Thank, thank you. you so much. I'm going to get a little more water before we begin, Joe. Okay. Hello, Joe. Hi. 34 people right now. Yeah. Okay, I'm about to mute everyone. Susan, Joe, I will unmute you almost immediately. Joe, Susan, you have to unmute yourselves. I can only mute people, I can't unmute them. I All got right it. then. Thank you. And if other folks will stay muted until Q&A time, that would be awesome. I apologize for all the teachers, to all the teachers for the bad use of awesome. My mother was a teacher and she would have <laughs> scolded me that of course, you know, awesome is like the Grand Canyon and you know, the birth of a child, awesome is not being muted. All right. That's really funny. Okay, I think we'll, we'll um, wait another minute or two and then, uh, <clears throat> and then get started. Okay. Start at five after and that's pretty good. And then we can, we can still let people in if they come late. Sounds good. Okay. The FBI or more audio right now. Who? Oh. Yeah. Right. Okay, well, let's get started. I, I want to welcome all of you to this commemoration of the atomic bombing of Nagasaki in 1945, 77 years ago. And we're really fortunate to have as our speaker tonight, Susan Southard, who's written a very excellent book about the lives of five teenagers who are survivors of the bombing. And I um, know of no other book that has made a, a careful study of the long-term consequences of US military attacks. Um, there may be one, but I don't, I've never seen one. Um, this, is, this is especially important now um, because we, we learn what happens in a nuclear, when nuclear weapons are used. And you see that people talking about that now with the um, war in, in Ukraine. So Susan's book, Nagasaki, Life After Nuclear War, is the recipient of Dayton Literary Peace Prize and the J. Anthony Lucas Book Prize, sponsored by the Columbia School of Journalism and Harvard University Neiman Foundation for Journalism. Nagasaki was also named a best book of the year by the Washington Post, The Economist, Kirkus Review, and the American Library Association. Nagasaki has been published in England, Spain, Denmark, China, Taiwan, and Japan, 
and excerpts of this book have appeared in journals around the world. Susan's work has also appeared in the New York Times, the Los Angeles Times, and Politico and others. She holds a Master of Fine Arts degree in creative writing from Antioch University, Los Angeles, and was a nonfiction fellow at Norman Mailer Center in Promisetown, Massachusetts. Susan has spoken before the United Nations and continues to speak at international disarmament conferences, universities, and public forums across the United States and abroad. She teaches graduate level nonfiction seminars and directed a three year creative writing program at a federal women's prison outside Phoenix. She was the founder and artistic director of the Phoenix based Essential theater serving marginalized communities across the Southwest for 32 years. So Susan, we're very happy to have you with us tonight and look forward to hearing what you have to tell us. Thank you so much, Joe. And thank you, George, to both of you for um, inviting me to be a part of this evening and for helping coordinate all the logistics as well. It's really a pleasure to be with you all tonight um, on this anniversary uh, period of the, uh, of the uh, Hiroshima and Nagasaki atomic bombings, as Joe said, 77 years. And as it happens, it is now uh, approximately 7.10 our time. And uh, that is, how, what? time is it in Japan? Uh, uh, I think it's eight or nine, 10. So right at this time, 77 years ago in Japan, Japan time, the um, US B-29 uh, bomber called Boxcar that carried, that was carrying the bomb to uh, its destination in Japan uh, was uh, crossing the Pacific on its way to ultimately Nagasaki. Um, and as Joe mentioned, uh, my book, Nagasaki Life After Nuclear War, tells the story of five survivors, all of whom were teenagers at the time of the bombing. And it follows their lives and the life of the whole city over the next 70 years. I'm gonna um, switch now to, um, screen share. Actually, I'm going to wait just a minute and tell you a few other things first. Like other parts of our nation's history, the stories of those who survived the 1945 atomic bombings have been, for the most part, denied, minimized, silenced, altogether forgotten, or so powerfully justified that even now, 77 years later, most people are across our nations know very little about what happened to the people in those two cities. They're not a part of our own history as a nation and as part of the global community. In the spirit of expanding our understanding of this history and holding it in our memory, today I'll read a few excerpts from my book and share some of the many stories of what happened beneath Nagasaki's mushroom cloud and the long aftermath of nuclear war. We'll have time for questions at the end of the presentation. Um, and also, if any of you here tonight uh, would like to or know someone who would like to teach Nagasaki life after nuclear war, uh, both at the high school or uh, university level, I'd like to mention that um, oh, an amazing educator in Pennsylvania and I collaborated a couple of years ago to create an educational toolkit for the book, uh, for the classroom, and it has many, many guiding questions and activities, uh, either for teaching the whole book or just for teaching uh, select excerpts, depending on an, uh, a teacher's uh, time and curriculum needs. And I'm noticing there's a lot of switching back and forth on the screen. Is everything okay? Joe, it is, is I'm trying okay to spotlight that? you and it keeps switching back to gallery view, but I think okay, it's thanks. good because I want people to see you. Thank you. Um, I was going to ask you one other thing, but I forgot. So, oh, now I'm going to screen share. 
go to my PowerPoint and we're going to pray that this works. Okay, can everybody see the cover of my book? Uh, maybe I can't see all of yes. it now because we I'm, can see I'm your book. Screen. Okay, okay, great. Um, okay, so hopefully I'm just going to do yes. Okay, good. So here we go with the actual uh, content of the presentation. There we go. I'd like to take you back to Japan in early August 1945, where the narrative of nuclear war began. By then, as I'm sure all of you know, the Pacific War provoked by Japan when it bombed Pearl Harbor had been raging for three years and seven and eight months. As Japan's depleted military kept pushing forward in its brutal conquest of East Asia and many Pacific Island nations, in the United States, the world's first atomic bombs were rushed to completion and shipped to a small island in the South Pacific to await their missions. Meanwhile, in Japan, by then US and allied bombers had attacked and destroyed all or major parts of 64 Japanese cities, killing an estimated 183,000 civilians, including in Tokyo, where firebombing attacks in March 1945 killed 100,000 people in one night. Across Japan, people were starving, and the only news they heard about the war was government-issued propaganda. The Nagasaki bombing was the third in a series of huge military events that happened very quickly. First, as everyone knows, on August 6, 1945, the United States dropped the first nuclear weapon used in warfare on Hiroshima. You can see it here on the map. That nuclear attack killed approximately 140,000 civilians. Second, two and a half days later, at midnight on August 9th, the Soviet Union joined the US and, and our allies against Japan by sending 1.5 million troops on three fronts across the border of Japanese held Manchuria, which is, can you see this? I don't know the timing of, of can you see me circling that area? Yes. Good, okay. Um, uh, so Russian, Russia sent troops uh, and, and, um, and attacked Jap Japanese held Manchuria on three fronts, 1.5 million troops. Um, and the Japanese military immediately knew they couldn't fend off this Soviet invasion. And it sent Japanese leaders into a frenzied emergency meeting in Tokyo later that morning. So this is the same morning as the Nagasaki bomb. And this is happening while the Nagasaki bomb is on its way to Japan. The Japanese leaders heatedly debated their terms of surrender, but they remained dead throughout the day and evening. Only 30 minutes after that meeting started, just after 11 a.m. on August 9, 1945, the U.S. dropped its second atomic bomb on Nagasaki. News of the bombing quickly reached the Japanese leaders in Tokyo, but by all accounts, the Nagasaki attack had no impact on their continuing debates or on the emperor's decision to surrender. Here at the bottom of uh, this of, of Japan's four main islands is Kyushu, the southernmost main island, and uh, Nagasaki is here on the western coast, about 500 miles from Shanghai and about 200 miles from the southern tip of the Korean Peninsula. Uh, Nagasaki was then and is now a beautiful small port city built around a long narrow bay with lush green hills on three sides. In 1945, the population of Nagasaki was 240,000 people. This is a photo. Joe, can you see that now? Okay. Uh, there's a little time lag, so I just wanted to make sure. This is a photograph uh, from 1945 of the Urakami Valley. Uh, it's the northern part of the city of Nagasaki. As you can see, it's packed with houses, shops, schools, and factories. And here, the Urakami Church 
uh, was the, at the time the largest Christian church in the Far East. In 1945, about 20,000 people in Nagasaki were Catholics. The bomb fell approximately here-ish, about one and a half miles from where the photographer is standing for this photo. The morning of August 9th was sunny and hot as the US B-29 B bomber carrying the bomb approached Nagasaki. In the city below, men, women, and children were digging cave-like air raid shelters into hillsides, hanging laundry, lining up at ration stations, and scouring the hills for weeds to boil into soup for their families. These are the five survivors whose stories I tell in my book. By 1944, Japanese law required all children over the age of 14 to leave school and work for the war effort. And I'll brief you, briefly introduce you. This is Wada Koichi. He was 18 at the time of the bombing, the oldest in my group of five here. And he worked as a streetcar driver. Here is Taniguchi Sumiteru. Taniguchi was 16 at the time of the bombing, and he worked as a postal delivery boy. Here is Nagano Etsuko. She was uh, also 16 at the time of the bombing, and she worked in a Mitsubishi, in a makeshift uh, Mitsubishi airplane parts factory uh, uh, alongside adult men. Here is Do Mineko-san. Do uh, was 15 at the time of the bomb, and she worked in a uh, Mitsubishi weapons factory. And here is Yoshida Katsuji. Yoshida was um, 13 at the time of the bomb. He's the youngest of these five, and so he was still in school. And this photograph was taken a few years before the bomb when he was perhaps 10 or 11. Well, here each of them mentioned at the end of this first excerpt, which begins at 11.01 that morning, the moment when from six miles above the city, the USB 29 bomber opened its bomb bay doors and released the bomb. The five ton plutonium bomb plunged toward the city at 614 miles per hour. 47 seconds later, a powerful implosion forced the bomb's plutonium core to compress from the size of a grapefruit to the size of a tennis ball, generating a nearly instantaneous reaction of nuclear fission. With colossal force and energy, the bomb detonated a third of a mile above the Urakami Valley and its 30,000 residents and workers. At 11.02 a.m., a super brilliant flash lit up the sky, visible from as far away as Omura Naval Hospital, more than 10 miles over the mountains, followed by a thunderous explosion equal to the power of 21,000 tons of TNT. The entire city convulsed. At its first point, the center of the explosion reached temperatures higher than at the center of the sun, and the velocity of its shock wave exceeded the speed of sound. The thermal heat of the bomb ignited a fireball with an internal temperature of over 540,000 degrees Fahrenheit. Within one second, the blazing fireball expanded from 52 feet to its maximum size of 750 feet in diameter. Within three seconds, the ground below reached an estimated 5,400 to 7,200 degrees Fahrenheit. Directly beneath the bomb, infrared heat rays instantly carbonized human and animal flesh and vaporized internal organs. As the atomic cloud billowed two miles overhead and eclipsed the sun, the bomb's vertical blast pressure crushed much of the Urakami Valley. Horizontal blast winds tore through the region at two and a half times the speed of a category five hurricane, pulverizing buildings, trees, plants, animals, and thousands of men, women, and children. In every direction, people were blown out of their shelters, houses, factories, schools, and hospital beds catapulted against walls or flattened beneath collapsed buildings. Those working in the fields, riding streetcars, and standing in line at city ration stations were blown off their feet or hit by plummeting debris 
and pressed to the scalding earth. An iron bridge moved 28 inches downstream. As their buildings began to implode, patients and staff jumped out of the windows of Nagasaki Medical College Hospital and mobilized high school girls leapt from the third story of Shiroyama Elementary School, a half mile from the blast. The blazing heat melted iron and other metals, scorched bricks and concrete buildings, ignited clothing, disintegrated vegetation, and caused severe and fatal flash burns on people's exposed faces and bodies. A mile from the detonation, the blast force caused nine inch brick walls to crack and glass fragments bulleted into people's arms, legs, backs, and faces, often puncturing their muscles and organs. Two miles away, thousands of people suffering flash burns from the extreme heat lay trapped beneath partially demolished buildings. At distances up to five miles, wood and glass splinters pierced through people's clothing and ripped into their flesh. Windows shot shattered as far as 11 miles away. Larger doses of radiation than any human had ever experienced penetrated deeply into the bodies of people and animals. The ascending fireball suctioned massive amounts of thick dust and debris into its churning stem. A deafening roar erupted as buildings throughout the city shuddered and crashed to the ground. It all happened in an instant, 13-year-old Yoshida remembered. He had barely seen the blinding light half a mile away before a powerful force hit him on his right side and hurled him into the air. The heat was so intense that I curled up like sudume, dried grilled squid, he said. In what felt like dreamlike slow motion, Yoshida was blown backward 130 feet across a field, a road, and an irrigation channel, then plunged to the ground landing on his back in a rice paddy flooded with shallow water. Inside the Mitsubishi Ohashi weapons factory, Do Mineko had been wiping perspiration from her face and concentrating on her work when Pato, an enormous blue-white flash of light burst into the building, followed by an ear-splitting explosion. Thinking a torpedo had detonated inside the plant, Do threw herself onto the ground and covered her head with her arms just as the factory came crashing down on top of her. In his short sleeved shirt, trousers, gaiters, and cap, Taniguchi had been riding his bicycle through the hills in the northwest corner of the valley when a sudden burning wind rushed toward him from behind, propelling him into the air and slamming him face down on the road. The earth was shaking so hard, he said, that I hung on as hard as I could so I wouldn't get blown away again. 15-year-old Nagano was standing inside an airplane parts factory, protected by distance and the wooded mountains that stood between her and the bomb. A light flashed, she remembered. Pika! Nagano too thought a bomb had hit her building. She fell to the ground, covering her ears and eyes with her thumbs and fingers, according to her training, as windows crashed in all around her. She could hear pieces of tin and broken roof tiles swirling and colliding in the air outside. Two miles southeast of the blast, Wada, the young streetcar driver, was sitting in the lounge of Hotaru Jaya Terminal talking with his friends. The train cables splashed. The whole city of Nagasaki was the light was indescribable, he said. An unbelievably massive light lit up the whole city. A violent explosion rocked the station. Wada and his friends dived for cover under tables and other furniture. In the next instant, he felt like he was floating in the air before him being slapped down on the floor. Something heavy landed on his back and he fell unconscious. Beneath the still rising mushroom cloud, a huge portion of Nagasaki had vanished. Tens of thousands throughout the city were dead or injured. On the floor of Hotarujaya terminal, Wada lay beneath a fallen beam. Nagano was curled up on the floor of the airplane parts factory, her mouth filled with glass slivers and choking dust. 
Dole injured in the wreckage of the collapsed Mitsubishi factory, engulfed in smoke. Yoshida was lying in a muddy rice paddy, barely conscious, his body and face brutally scorched. Taniguchi clung to the searing pavement near his mangled bicycle, not yet realizing that his back was burned off. He lifted his eyes just long enough to see a young child swept away like a fleck of dust. 60 seconds had passed. These are two uh, aerial shots of the Hypo Center area. Uh, the uh, one on top was taken by the US military two days before the bombing. And as you can see, that part of the city still existed. And then this one below was uh, taken three days after the bombing when that in part of the city was entirely gone. Uh, this is a photograph of the Hypo Center area taken at about 2 p.m. the following day. Near the center here, is an air raid uh, shelter, the opening to an air raid shelter uh, built into the ground, most likely beneath a building that is now uh, disintegrated. Uh, and in the foreground, you can see charred bodies that are in the same position that they fell to the ground at the uh, moment the bomb detonated. And in the distance here, you see smokestacks from one of the Mitsubishi factories in the city. And over here, I have to move the, over here uh, to the uh, right, it's very uh, faint, but that uh, it's on the hillside there is um, the ruins of the Chinze Junior High School uh, uh, surrounded by smoke. So sometimes it doesn't work, here we go. This is a photo taken a bit later that day at a uh, relief station, um, if that's what you can call it, um, uh, gathered near Nagasaki's main road, just about a mile from the Hypo Center. The casualty count in Nagasaki at the end of 1945 was 74,000 people killed 75,000 more injured and irradiated. Of those killed, only 150 were military personnel. Collectively, these people, both in Nagasaki and Hiroshima, became known as Hibaksha, which means atomic bomb affected people. For most Americans, the historical image of the atomic bombings has been and still is a mushroom cloud rising high above the city of Nagasaki or Hiroshima an image that doesn't capture what happened to the people of those two cities beneath the mushroom clouds. For most Americans, the bombings are seen as abstract events of the past, military actions that ended the Pacific War. But for Hibaksha, there's nothing abstract about nuclear war. And for many, the war still has never ended. The next excerpt I'll read describes the first signs of whole body radiation exposure in Nagasaki. At this point in the story, it's mid-August, Japan has just surrendered, but the US occupation forces haven't arrived yet. They came in early September, or actually mid-September by the time they were in country. In this excerpt, you'll hear the name Dr. Akizuki, a young physician who's a secondary character in the book. Before the bombing, he was the director of a 70-bed tuberculosis hospital near the Hypo Center. Only the skeleton of the building seen here remained after the nuclear attack. Within a week of the bombing, thousands of men, women, and children across Nagasaki and the surrounding region began to experience inexplicable combinations of symptoms, high fever, dizziness, loss of appetite, nausea, headache, diarrhea, bloody stools, nosebleeds, whole body weakness, and fatigue. Their hair fell out in large clumps. Their burns and wounds secreted extreme amounts of pus 
and their gums swelled, became infected and bled. Purple spots appeared on their bodies, at first about the size of a pinprick, one doctor recalled, but growing within a few days to the size of a grain of rice or a pea. The spots were signs of hemorrhaging beneath the skin. Infections throughout the body were rampant, including lar the large intestine, eso the esophagus, bronchial passages, lungs, and uterus. Within a few days of the appearance of their initial symptoms, many people lost consciousness, mumbled deliriously, and died in extreme pain. Others languished for weeks before either dying or slowly recovering. Even those who had suffered no external injuries fell sick and died. Some relief workers and victims' family members who had come into the hypo center area after the bombing also suffered serious illness. Fear gripped the city. As the pattern of symptoms, illness, and death became clear, some people pulled on their hair every morning to see if their time had come. Believing in, that the illness was contagious, many families turned away relatives and guests who were staying with them after the bombing. And some farmers outside Nagasaki reused food to hungry refugees from the city. At first, Dr. Akizuki and other physicians suspected dysentery, cholera, or possibly some form of liver disease. Others thought the illness was due to poisonous gas released by the bomb. By August 15th, however, when Japanese scientists confirmed that an atomic bomb had been dropped on Nagasaki, physicians deduced that what appeared to be an epidemic killing their city was somehow related to radiation contamination. This discovery was helpful in ruling out contagious diseases and other conditions, but it did nothing to minimize the mystifying, confusing, and terrifying truth about the invisible power of the bomb. People died koro 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 koro, one after another. Dr. Akizuki likened the situation to the Black Death pandemic that devastated Europe in the 1300s. Observing the cremations taking place in his hospital yard, he wondered if his body too might soon be burned. Life or death was a matter of chance, of fate, he said, and the dividing line between the man being cremated and the doctor cremating him was slight. A second wave of radiation illnesses and deaths swept through the city in late August and early September and continued through early October. Dr. Akizuki and his whole staff came down with nausea, diarrhea, and fatigue, which he remembered made me feel as if I had been beaten all over my body. From Dr. Akizuki's perspective, from his burned out hospital on top of Motuhara Hill, death carved a clear geographical path. The first people who suffered and died from radiation-related illness were living inside an air raid shelter at the bottom of the hill, closer to the hypocenter, so they had received larger doses of radiation. The illness then climbed the hill, killing people in relative order according to their distance from the atomic blast. When the next tier of people grew sick, they were carried to the hospital grounds by their neighbors who lived farther up the hill, and the distance between the homes of the sick and the hospital became shorter and shorter. The Maekawa family, the Matsuokas, and then the Yamaguchis were attacked by radiation sickness, Dr. Akizuki remembered. I named this widening advance of the disease the concentric circles of death. He watched as his neighbor, Mr. Yamaguchi, lost 13 family members from atomic bomb sickness. After each death, Mr. Yamaguchi carried the body to the cemetery, dug a grave, and called for the priest. After each ceremony, he returned home to care for his remaining family members, all of whom who had, had fallen ill. They're dead one by one, he told Dr. Akizuki. Who will send for the priest when I am dying? Who will dig my grave when I am gone? This is a photo of a classroom inside a damaged elementary school that was used as a temporary relief hospital. The patients are lying on the floor with surviving medical personnel, family members, and volunteers caring for them. Meanwhile, high-level officials in the United States were adamantly and publicly refuting news reports 
out of Hiroshima and Nagasaki that large numbers of people were suffering and dying from radiation exposure. In late August and early September 1945, for example, General Leslie Groves, director of the Manhattan Project where the atomic bombs were developed, tried to deflect public discussion about the bomb's radiation effects by insisting on the lawfulness of the bomb's use and their decisive role in ending the war. The atomic bomb is not an inhuman weapon, he stated in the New York Times. I think our best answer to anyone who doubts this is that we did not start the war, and if they don't like the way we ended it, to remember who started it. Later that year, General Groves testified before the US Senate that death from high dose radiation exposure is, quote, without undue suffering and a very pleasant way to die. Over the next few years, top US leaders censored the Japanese press from reporting on Nagasaki and Hiroshima, even within that country. Uh, limited, they limited American media coverage of the human impact of the bombings and launched a media campaign in the United States to quell growing public criticism of the bombings and promote public support to, for further US nuclear development nuclear weapons development. The campaign culminated in an extended article on the decision to use the bomb written by former Secretary of War Henry Stimson, published in Harper's Magazine in February 1947. Unbeknownst to everyday Americans, however, the article was filled with numerous misstatements and omissions, effectively forging a singular atomic bomb narrative with such moral certitude that it has superseded all others and fundamentally shaped American memory and perception ever since. That the atomic bombings ended the war and saved a million American lives. All of this with no mention of the other side of the story. What happened to the men, women, and children beneath those mushroom clouds? Back in Nagasaki, the effects of the bomb didn't stop. In the nine months after the nuclear attack, many women who were pregnant at the time of the bombing lost their babies, and many babies who survived birth developed physical and mental disabilities. For years, people lived in the ruins in flimsy shacks built on top of charred fragments of human bone. Caring for their injured, irradiated, and dying loved ones, even as they themselves were often injured or ill. The psychological anguish from the instantaneous disappearance of their city and loss of entire families and communities was often too much to, to bear. Suicides were common. And then in 1948, three years after the bombing, Leukemia and other cancer rates spiked across the city, causing more deaths and initiating a cycle of cancer rates that would last for decades. Even today, radiation scientists are actively studying second and third generation Hibakusha for genetic effects that may still show up, potentially passed down to them from their parents and grandparents, reminding us how much we still don't know, even now, about the insidious nature of radiation exposure to the human body. So uh, in my book, there are so many profound, and dramatic, and unique, and even touching or uh, funny stories, um, not I mean, not about post-nuclear survival, but because all of these um, individuals that, whose stories I tell grew up to be full human beings um, that, who also had senses of humor. Um, and so I tell their stories and the story of the whole city um, in the book, but I can't tell you so many of those stories right now. And so for my final excerpt today, I've chosen just one survivor. Uh, to tell you about, and his name is Yoshida Katsuji. He's one of the most generous and caring and hilarious people I've ever known, and I really adored him. 
first, um, just a little bit more about his experience to give you the context for the excerpt I'll read. Here's, here he is again, as you can see, this is when he was 10, but he was 13 at the time of the bombing. But he was a small, small boy, even at 13. And um, at the time, at the moment of the uh, nuclear blast, uh, Yoshida was thrown backwards 130 feet and landed in a rice paddy. Because he had been facing in the direction of the bomb when it detonated, his entire face and much of his neck uh, were scorched. The next day, his parents found him lying unconscious on the ground. They found a broken ba baby carriage in the ruins and pushed him four miles through the embers, then over the mountains to their home. For nearly four months, while he was still unconscious, Yoshida's mother cared for him at home, putting tiny pieces of food into his scorched lips and using scissors to scrape the maggots from his body which was enveloped in the smell of his own decaying flesh. Finally, in December 1945, Yoshida was transported to a naval hospital north of the city. There he eventually regained consciousness and underwent three skin graft surgeries to his face. These, um, can you see Joe? The two, you can just give me a sign. Yes, I can see those. Thank you so much. Um, on the left here, uh, these are photos taken before on the left, before his second uh, skin graft surgery. And on the right was just after that same surgery. These photographs are now hanging in the Nagasaki Atomic Bomb Museum. After 13 months in the hospital, Yoshida finally returned home in 1947, still severely disfigured. And the story of his return home, he was by himself on the train going home um, is really very moving. And like so many other disfigured hibaksha, Yoshida remained inside his house for years, rarely going out for fear of people's stares. Eventually though, um, after a few years, his father died and he had to go to work to help support his family. This photo was taken in 1950 when Yoshida was 19 and he worked in a grocery store warehouse in the back where no one would see him. Um, and uh, it's difficult to see in this photo how scarred his face is, um, but you'll see more in a few minutes uh, in later photographs. Um, but I do wanna mention that I really like that hairdo. And here he is some years later, sitting by the ocean. The last excerpt that I'm gonna to read tonight skips way ahead, past the many challenges of long-term nuclear survival, past the time when Yoshida in his 20s made a conscious decision to be happy, past the complications of marriage and children, to the 1990s. It's the first time Yoshida tells his story publicly, and it shows how he speaks to children about his experiences. All of the survivors whose stories I tell in my book had different reasons, different transform transformational experiences that led them to join a small group of survivors who, in defiance of social norms, began speaking publicly about their experiences. Their goal was simple to do everything possible to ensure that Nagasaki is the last atomic bomb city in history. At this point in the story, Yoshida was in his 60s and a quick note about his appearance, which mostly you can see here. He wore a large black patch on his uh, um, right ear and that patch was secured to his head by a, an elastic band that went up over his balding head and down on the uh, left side of his face and down under his chin. Um, the scar tissue, as you can see here, covered his uh, face and neck. His left ear was shriveled. He had lost his right ear after the bombing. It melted off, but in his left ear was also shriveled. And you can see behind these large frame glasses that his eyes are uneven, one higher than the other. And whenever he smiled, he revealed a crooked mouth and severely misshapen teeth. 
Although Yoshida admired the Hibaksha who chose to speak publicly and thought of them as pioneers, he himself remained silent. I was shy to be in front of people, especially women. Everyone looked at me like this, he grimaced. I didn't like it. One day, however, a good friend approached Yoshida to ask if he could take his place at a talk he was scheduled to give to junior high school students visiting Nagasaki. Yoshida agreed, but when he arrived at the site and saw all the students staring at him, he immediately regretted it. Unraveled by the students' fear of making eye contact with him and what he thought was their revulsion, Yoshida stood before them and told his story. Some students began crying, and when Yoshida looked up at them, he nearly burst into tears himself. Afterward, many of the children expressed their appreciation to him. Yoshida, however, was so shaken by the experience that he returned momentarily to silence, but not for long. In his ongoing effort to accept his disfigurement, Yoshida came to terms with the fact that he could not change what had happened to him or how he looked. And he decided to no longer let his shyness get in the way of speaking out for peace. Outside the Nagasaki Atomic, excuse me, outside the Nagasaki Atomic Bomb Museum in 2007, 75 year old Yoshida turns toward the crowds of uniformed talkative students lining up for tours and presentations by survivors. He locates the group of students that is scheduled to hear his story that day, greets the head teacher, then races to the head of the line to hold the museum door open for the class, urging them inside until the last child has entered. Now, he says, beaming, 9.5 out of 10 children don't cry when they see my face. To help the students feel comfortable, for years, Yoshida has joked that he is as good looking as Kimutaku, a handsome Japanese pop star from the 1990s. Now, however, Kimu, Kimutaku, still a handsome actor in his 40s or 50s, no longer evokes the humorous comparison Yoshida intends. A colleague suggested that he update the actor he compares himself to, but Yoshida never has done so, except once in Chicago, when he likened his incredible good looks to those of Leonardo DiCaprio. In Nagasaki, when children ask him for his autograph after his talks, he signs it Grandpa Yoshida and adds in parentheses, Grandpa Kimutaku. This is what I say to children, he explains. Have you ever looked up Hewa, peace, in the dictionary? They never have. They've never looked it up because we don't need to know what peace is during peacetime. Let's look it up together, he says to the children. He pauses and adds emphatically, our greatest enemy is carelessness. We need to pay attention to peace. So it's 2022, 70 years, 77 years after the bombing of Nagasaki and Hiroshima. Why does it matter? Why does it matter for us to learn, to understand the survivors' stories? From my perspective, a first and major reason is that the deaths, injury, and irradiation of these civilians took place at our hands. But their stories matter for other reasons as well. They matter because they give us context for the 13,000 nuclear weapons that exist in the world today, far more powerful than those used on Nagasaki and Hiroshima. About 9,600 of these weapons are actively deployed or stockpiled across the globe, waiting and ready for use upon command whether by intentional military use, nuclear accident, or an act of terrorism, including the intense explosions at the Ukrainian nuclear power plant currently held by Russia. Right now, we are at enormously high risk for far worse humanitarian and environmental disasters than Nagasaki and Hiroshima. The survivor stories matter because as long as these weapons exist, we must imagine and understand what nuclear war really means. And Hibaksha are the only people in history who can tell us firsthand what these weapons do. 
Their stories matter because the American narrative of the bombings, that they ended the war and saved a million or more American lives, is at best oversimplistic. And it has allowed us for 77 years to ignore, minimize, or justify what happened beneath those mushroom clouds. How can we and how can our leaders make sound decisions about our future if we don't examine and understand the full consequences of our past actions? As Hibaksha age and their voices fade, their stories matter because they invite us to understand how fiercely we must imagine and manifest peace in a world without nuclear weapons. Hibaksha have lived this long history. Wada Koichi, Taniguchi Sumiteru, Nagano Etsuko, Do Mineko, and Yoshida Katsuji. I strongly believe that it's our responsibility to remember this history. It is our responsibility to know and remember this history, not only because we are the nation that inflicted this egregious harm, but also because not only Hibaksha, but we too want to ensure that Nagasaki is the last atomic bomb city in history. Thank you. I'll just close by saying, if you'd like to reach out to me for any reason, uh, here's my email address and my website. And as I said before, if you should know any um, high school or university educators who'd be interested in this um, or a revised presentation um, or the educational toolkit, which um, we provide for free, um, please let me know. And um, thank you again. And I'll now stop my screen sharing so we can hear your questions or discuss whatever is on your mind. Thank you so much again. Yeah, thank you. That was a, an amazing presentation and uh, so important for us to, to hear and, and know what was going on then and, and what could happen now. Um, mm. So we can, we can take questions now. And um, so, um, if you'd like to to have a question, raise your hand. Uh, you can um, do that with the react in your reactions at the bottom of the screen. Uh, Brian Brian Winters has a question. Thank you. Yeah, un ask, unmute yourself, Brian, if you can. Okay. I'm okay. Thank you, Susan, for that that presentation. That was um, that was very. Excellent, I appreciate it. Uh, I wanted to ask you about the beginning. You you talked about the Soviet invasion of um, of uh, Manchurian uh, China, the Japanese. I would read somewhere else that the Japanese had actually reached out to ask Russia to negotiate a okay. to negotiate their settlement um, the day before on August eighth. I was wondering, could you could confirm that or speak to that? I don't remember the date any longer. Um, this book was 12 years in the making, and it's been, um, what, well, seven years since it was published. And some of the small details I don't remember anymore. That's not a small detail, but I don't remember that. But they did do that. Um, my, it was really hard to untangle that aspect of what was happening right there in early August. Um, uh, the, from my understanding, the Japanese did reach out to the, Rus the uh, Russians, but um, it's hard, it was hard for me to discern, excuse me, to discern from any of the great historians I read how um, seriously anyone took those, um, that, uh, that um, contact. Um, and certainly Russia was already um, 
moving its troops, you know, had, had, moving its troops. Russia had promised to in, uh, join the uh, Allies um, three months after Pots, not Potsdam, three months after the end of the European war. So it was it was time. So it was really difficult. To, I, I didn't include it, uh, except for possibly a mention in my book, because there's no indication that Russia did anything with that. And it, there was no indication of how serious, you know, Japan itself was really, the Japanese leaders were really divided on, on the whole aspect of uh, surrender. Mostly, I don't know if they were so divided on surrender, but they were divided on the terms of surrender. And that, that was um, so, um, they were so fiercely divided that even um, when they were debating surrender, they couldn't come to a decision and finally had to take it to the emperor um, to make to break the stalemate. So that's that's what I know about that. Chris, do you have a have a question? Oh, thank you. Yes, Ms. Southard, and thank you for your book. I was a serviceman in Okinawa and took a trip to Hiroshima where I had the opportunity to stay overnight at a hostel and met a lady who was Hibaksha in the sense that she was a uh, pregnancy and her mother at the time of that explosion. Uh, the hostel was run by uh, an American uh, initiated mm -hmm. organization, the World Friendship Center, and I was wondering yeah. if there was anything like that in, in Nagasaki. I actually stayed there um, at the World Friendship Center in Hiroshima. Um, not that I know of in Nagasaki, um, partic in particular, um, there are many organizations that welcome visitors, but the World Friendship Center is, I think, unique in Hiroshima. Um, originally in my book, I was going to um, tell the story of both cities. And my first research trip in 2003, I, I went to both cities and interviewed survivors and did research, but then um, in the next few year, year or two after I got back, um, I began to see how different uh, the two experiences were. That it was different cities, different cultures, different geographies, climate, um, uh, and did I say culture, and um, also even different bombs themselves. So I, I, I chose Nagasaki because it was less known and because I had more people that I knew there that would be able to help me and I needed a lot of help to do all the research. That's wonderful that you were able to go there. What was it like for you to go? Um, you were serving in Okinawa. Yes, well, it just happened that uh, the planes available from Okinawa made it uh, feasible to get to Hiroshima. I'd seen Mr. Hersey's book earlier. In the uh -huh. of summer. I see. Thank you. Joe's, Joe, you have a question. Yes. How's that? Can you hear me? Yes. yes. Okay. So, Susan, first of all, thank you very much for your presentation. It was excellent. Uh, I, I wanted to especially thank you for the, uh, uh, including uh, Secretary of State Stimson, uh, that propaganda uh, uh, episode where he came out and, and, and said that we needed to drop the, the, uh, the bomb to save lives and, and the war, stuff like that. Uh, and actually, uh, since this is uh, uh, sponsored by uh, Peace Action, it was actually uh, one of the founders of Peace Action, uh, Norman Cousins, who was interviewing all of the, uh, uh, the generals after World War II. And apparently none of them said that it was militarily necessary. And, and so, uh, uh, and it was Cousins who said this was a crime. And, uh, and, and actually it was the, uh, uh, the head of the Manhattan Project, uh, uh, James Conant, who took Cousins uh, editorial and, and it really it bothered him because they intended to use nuclear bombs again in the future for our, for our next time we go to war. And uh, so, it, it initiated uh, this big uh, propaganda campaign. And as a matter of fact, uh, you know, after people read your book, uh, I would suggest that they take a look, or you could take a look at 
the decision to drop the atomic bomb by uh, Al Gar Alperovitz. And as a matter of fact, he talks about Russia's entry into the war, you know, and, 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 and uh, what, man, what effect that had on the decision. But the, um, the big lie that America believes that we needed to use the atomic bomb to end the war persists. And I mean, that, 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 that lie is, 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 is rock solid. And, and, and so uh, when you talk to people about uh, getting rid of nuclear weapons today, uh, one of the key things in our State Department, they say we need nuclear weapons. We can't give them up. And, and so it, it's, uh, but anyway, I wanna thank you again for uh, including that part in your presentation. And uh, actually, Alberich goes into depth about how that preparation came about and it was a blueprint for the Iraq war, for uh, George Bush and, and, and neocons. Uh, they, 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 they followed it almost to the T. And, and so it's, it, it, it's, it's important. But thank you again for all your work on this. You're welcome. Um, one thing I would say is um, that I think uh, in addition to the really hard, hard-lined argument that Stimson put forth, um, I also think that for good reasons, uh, I mean, uh, of course, I don't think Americans knew what we did to close Japan off um, and, you know, trigger some of the decisions Japan made, including possibly Pearl Harbor. But nonetheless, Japan, Burl, uh, Japan bombed us and um, the hatred over the the bombing, the Pearl Harbor, and the um, the immense cost of the um, Pacific War was so intense. Uh, the hatred toward the Japanese people, and uh, I think that played into being it being much easier to accept that uh, that that. Um, line that 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 um, rationalization about the bombing and also I think that I think it's human nature that whenever we cause great harm to someone it's easy it, we don't want to see it it's hard to look at it's hard to look at what you know and uh, for many people especially if they're angry or, or filled with hate so it's a very complicated dynamic our Americans have or generally Americans have I think with the atomic bombings Right. Thank you so much. Yeah. Randa, would you like to ask your question? Yes, I just wanted to say hi to Susan. And <laughs> hi, Randa. Hi. And Karen, Karen is camping, uh, so she can't uh, get online. And uh, so I told her that I'd be seeing you. Oh, thank you. Um, and of course, I remember when you were writing the book. Uh, <laughs> That's right. Right. Uh, <laughs> a long time ago. Right. But I, I have to say, um, of course, uh, it's, it's just astonishing how you've uh, found all of these things to actually bring us such heart, heartful information. But, you know, it's how you mm. present it. And I don't know how in the world you can do this time after time. You know, that's really a gift to mm. uh, people that need to hear this information. Because it's got to be hard. Hard. I mean, I understand you uh, understand acting, and you understand uh, how to present. Um, I think that um, it's harder before it starts. I just feel overwhelmed with grief, <laughs> and it's really hard before it starts. But then when I start, you know, I I try to you know do it on behalf of yeah. those stories I'm telling. It's not it, but it is hard. It's a it's. It's a difficult story. Although if any of you have the chance to read the book, um, after the first, about half, it's pretty, it's pretty rough, the first half, um, but um, there are some really um, lovely and deep and um, you know, humane and funny and flaw, you know, it shows the flaws of their characters too. It's really, um, so I really grew to it love all of them for, for who they were as individuals. Yes. Uh, well, thank you. Thank you for your work, uh, all your work. Thank you, Randa. It's so nice that you're here tonight. Yes.
My love to Karen too. All right, thanks. And do you want to ask your question? You're you're muted, Anne. I do recommend your book. It when I first saw it, I thought, oh no, I don't need this. I know it. And of course, <laughs> it goes way beyond that. Um, I'd like to, you know, just what you're telling us is overwhelming, but I'd like to move to an action uh, perspective. What you're doing is invaluable. Um, what else do you see going on um, that helps um, bring nuclear weapons under control and abolition? About 12 count uh, towns in the Piedmont are now trying to get the ICANN cities appeal passed. Um, wow. Do you, do you have any comments on that? What other initiatives do you see as important? Well, I love that. Um, and I, I am afraid I don't know all the details, but a, a friend of mine in New York City and her colleagues got, um, I, I don't know if it's Manhattan or the whole city, they got they got a some kind of a nuclear ban going on. I was like, it took them so long to do. Um, well, you know, it's a massive, massive challenge. Um, but just like every other challenge, you know, every small step along the way matters. Um, some of you may know about the um, International Treaty on the Prohibition of Nuclear Weapons. That is a United Nations treaty, but it was um, one of the first that was um, created over many years between mm -hmm. civil society and diplom the diplomatic corps to, thank you, Mary, for putting that up, uh, to, because they, uh, the civil society organizations, anti-nuclear organizations kept coming to them with the humanitarian impact as opposed to the political or military needs. And um, it was very, very exciting. And I got to speak at the UN um, before, right as the um, initiative was being launched at the UN. And then I think it was the next year, 2017 is when it first passed. And then uh, it opened for signatures, which was huge. And, and then it went into force with over 50 countries signing. And um, now I, I just looked it up today to make sure I was up to date, there are 66 nations that have ratified and 86 that are signatories in the process. It's a long process to ratify, I understand. And um, so there's that. Any way that, uh, you know, becoming involved in any of the organiza major organizations I can and reaching critical will are the two that I know the best um, are uh, really helpful. The United States is a long way from uh, getting there, but their strategy, which I think really fascinates me, is to try to take the route of um, the chemical weapons ban, which was to get a lot of countries signed on and then chip away at the major powers until the pressure was too great and, and they couldn't um, uh, not sign anymore. And nuclear weapons is, I think, an even harder case to um, do that with, but I don't think it's impossible. And so anything that you can do to support that would be great. Also, I don't know other local ones. Maybe there's some people here who do here in this meeting because I haven't worked, uh, you know, I worked on this book for 12 years and um, I haven't, um, except for speaking and, and doing, I've done that a lot. And that's, that's part, of the, part of the work. But as far as the activism work, and um, uh, that's been my part mostly, and and supporting and observing and cheering, I can and others um, on. Do you know any Anne, or do others in the room know? Well, to share this? Would, if you do, let's go briefly to make sure that we get to all okay. the questions. Okay, I would say uh, peace action is focused on this. Women's International League for Peace and Freedom is focused on it. Definitely. A major movement is don't bank on the bomb. Um, mm -hmm. Tax refusal is certainly an important route uh, that some feel able to take. 
So uh, I'll just list those right now. I think ICANN is really important for building the peace movement and just educating people. They don't know in this country that there's a treaty that we could sign. I know, and I can't even get when the treaty uh, when the treaty uh, got what's it called entered into force. I wrote a um, an op ed and and no major paper would take it. <laughs> so I, it was like not that's not interesting. You know, there it was. It, it's we have a long way to go. Yeah. Veterans for Peace is another. I'll quickly add that. Eric, and thank Lindsay you. Have a, thank have you so much, Ann. Eric, you, you can. Yeah, there you go. <clears throat> thank you, uh, uh, Susan, for your contribution to um, to allow us to hear the voices of these living links to the horror of Nagasaki. Uh, and their appeal to that we abolish nuclear weapons. <clears throat> I'm used to hearing about uh, the bombing of the two cities rather than the war, nuclear war. It, it seemed to suggest that it wasn't reciprocated, but it, you don't know how to walk, drop into the bombs. And uh, I wonder if you would talk about uh, uh, that when, and I say when, we use nuclear weapons again uh, in an exchange with other country uh, that it's not survivable and there, there won't be anybody to write a book about the stories of survivors. I wonder mm -hmm. what your, your thoughts are about that. Well, um, I know what you mean that it, it wasn't reciprocated. Thank God it wasn't and it wasn't possible for uh, any nation to have reciprocated at that moment. Um, but I do consider that because we were at war with um, Japan, uh, that this was nuclear war. In our, we 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 introduced nuclear weapons into the into the war that already existed. So that's where I use that term. As far as survivability, you're so right, and um, um, it's. Um, it's a, it, that, that may be another, it, you know, the, the biggest argument I think that most um, nuclear nations use is deterrence. And um, I think that, you know, if deterrence really worked, you know, we have um, North Korea, for example, or other nations that it would have prevented from uh, allowing them to have nuclear weapons or, having them feel comfortable developing them. So I think really working um, the deterrence argument is important. And also that, that came to me because working the survivability argument, you know, if, if there are any way to, um, for any leaders of, of, uh, of any nuclear nations to seriously talk about, this is absurd because even if they're not used, they can be used by terrorists or they could be, uh, there have been many close calls on the use of them by accident. Um, so, um, you know, talking about the survivability would be one really strong argument. And, um, you know, what, what's the point? You know, I don't know. It's, it's a complicated thing and, and I have to always, untangle it even for myself when I'm talking. And I, I hope I'm not too unclear right now. Mary, Mary do you have a, a question or comment, Mary Ryder? Um, I do, I just, well, one thing, Susan, I was wondering, did you present this a number of years ago to the uh, group that gathers outside of the federal post office on Hillsborough Street? Um, the Committee to Abolish Nuclear Weapons. No, I didn't. You didn't? Oh, gosh, I thought... Actually, thought she, 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 okay. she, we, were at a cafe, we were in a cafe. Uh, yes. Know, that's, that's where she... Oh, she yeah. Yeah, I met many of you uh, briefly a number of years ago when um, Tom, Dr. Tomonaga, the leading radiation physician in Nagasaki, was um, here. Yes, uh, you were traveling. Um, 
Yeah. Well, I'm so glad to reconnect with you. I just Me wanted too. to say, um, <clears throat> I, I also think the whole kind of American exceptionalism is a huge problem. Mm -hmm. My husband and I were giving a talk one time, it's been quite a while, at the um, universe, uni Unitarian Church in uh, Raleigh. And when we got done with the talk, someone stood up and he said, well, my brother was on the ground with the US military. And, and if, he, if that bomb hadn't been dropped, he'd have been killed and other Americans would have been killed. And it's that valuing of American lives over other lives that I think is a, a huge problem. And I don't I really agree. know. It's a very, very, very challenging one. When I do publish in, in uh, last year, was it last year, what, where are we, 2022? It, no, two years ago, I, I had an op-ed in the Washington Post um, and I got more than 3,300 responses. Most of them were just, you know, explosively outraged. Yes. Um, of course, the Washington Post um, gave my op-ed a title that, that said the opposite of what my piece said <laughs> in order to provoke readers, you know. But nonetheless, um, I, I do think that American exceptionalism is really, it's so deep in our in our culture and in our way of thinking. And it's, it's damaging on so many levels, not only on this nuclear level, both in World War II and now, um, but in so many other aspects of our, of our lives. Could I say one more thing at risk of talking too long? Um, my dad was a career Marine. And as he got older, he started to re-examine all of that. And he said to me, you know, we were really, uh, just begging Japan to come in. We took all our all our warships out to Hawaii, you know, and and then just sat them there. So so Japan knew that we were trying to take over, and so they their action was actually a reaction. Um, and so I think sometimes it just helps to delve into the history a little more than just what we were taught in our mm -hmm. history books at, uh, yeah. you know, we in our schools. Seen very much, even at best, you know. Rachel, you've got a question. You're, you're muted, Rachel. I just watched the movie the day after. Oh, you did? Um, and... Uh, the guy who directed it, Nicholas Meyer, he went to the University of Iowa with me. And so, you know, I thought, wow. And, but he, he gave, a, an, in Wikipedia, there's a lot of information about how he wanted to make the movie even more realistic than it was. Uh, the Defense Department was after him. They didn't like what he was doing. And uh, even Hollywood and all the people behind the movie, they were, you know, trying to tone him down. But, you know, what was in the movie, I thought was pretty bad myself. And um, I don't see how anybody could watch that movie and not come back being an anti-nuclear war person. And just to see those missiles go up in the sky headed for the other countries, knowing that there's other missiles coming back at you. Uh, it's just really earth shaking, literally. Yeah, I agree. Mm. I had forgotten about that film. I never saw it. Yeah, you can get it on YouTube. Uh, maybe I won't. <laughs> <laughs> I say that because I, I feel like I lived, I lived through 12 years of nuclear war in my mind. So I, I, like, I don't wanna see it anymore. And the Nagasaki uh, bomb was a lot more potent than the Hiroshima one, was it? Or was yes, it exactly it was, the same? It, no, it was far more powerful, but it because of Nagasaki's geography, which um, is a valley surrounded on three sides by mountains, or, they're not tall mountains at all, but they are you know, tall hills or small mountains. Um, the impact of the bomb was less than in uh, the the less powerful bomb in Hiroshima because Hiroshima's flat. And so it went straight out. The, the mountains in Nagasaki um, 
uh, muted a lot of the impact that could have happened if, if they hadn't been there. So, so that's why they used those two different locations. One was a mountainous area and one was a flat layer. Actually, uh, some of you may know that Nagasaki wasn't the, the uh, primary target that day. The primary oh, yeah. target was a city, uh, but I, I can't remember, 100 or 100 more miles north of, on the same island, but on the northern coast of Kyushu called Kokura. And um, ironically, the, um, the planes, the, there were two planes that got there, the plane with the bomb and the observing plane. And, um, and it was covered in smoke uh, and, uh, and, and uh, clouds cloud cover and smoke, they had bombed, uh, allies had bombed a nearby city and the wind had changed. And so there was smoke from the city and cloud cover. And they took flak, they, 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 they were fired at and they circled around a number of times. And then they knew they had to set, head to the second, the secondary target before they ran out of fuel because they had to get back to, um, not all the way back to Tinian Island, but um, to, the, to the place they were gonna land. And they were already having a fuel problem. It was a dramatic. Um, flight for them. So Nagasaki, and Nagasaki was covered in clouds too, and then what the um, bombardier saw a small hole in the clouds and said, I got it. And it was really off, off target a couple of miles, but um, it was the city. I don't think they cared. Thank you. Oh, oh, let me just tell you one other thing. They chose targets because there were not that many targets left in Japan that were, hadn't been bombed. And so they saved a few cities um, and they had, My to, gosh. they had to have a certain criteria. And uh, I wrote about it in the book, but one of them, they had to be, um, they had to not have been bombed yet or not seriously bombed. Nagasaki had been bombed, but, but without much damage. And then they had to um, have, they had to be within the distance that the, from Tinian Island that the, uh, the aircraft could make it back with fuel. And then they had to um, have uh, factories surrounded by factory worker residences. That was one of the things too, that really. Mm. So there were, uh, and there may have been one or two other criteria that I'm not remembering right now. So that's how they chose. Such a matter of fact method. Mm. Yes. George, do you wanna? You had a comment. I do. Thanks so much for this, Susan. I learned a lot. Not necessarily things I wanted to learn because it was pretty brutal. Not what you did, but the whole process. Um, mm -hmm. And thanks to Mary Ryder and both of you all for pointing out what you named as US exceptionalism. And I want to remind all of us that that is straight up white supremacy. We call it U.S. exceptionalism. We may call it a lot of stuff, but it's white supremacy in terms of, you know, yeah. we can take lives or our government does because some lives are valued more than others. And that exceptionalism is the same as white supremacy. And now in 2022, it's manifested in different ways. And part of our work for peace and justice is to deal with that too. But that was just half of what I wanted to say. The other half is... I did have the joy before and pleasure. Before you go on to the other half, before you go to the other half, I just want to tell you how much I appreciate your saying that. I really, really do. And I think I may be, if you don't mind, I, I may um, refer to that in future presentations when people ask what we can do, because by, by countering white supremacy in all the different ways that we can in, in our country, that right. is also part of the movement of the anti-nuclear movement. So anyway, it absolutely thank you. is. Yes, absolutely. It's the work. But I did have the joy and honor of 2005, it's 60 years of being in Hiroshima on my birthday. And, wow. you know, 10,000 people sang me happy birthday. It was awesome. I met one of the Hibachua. She had been in grammar school the morning that the bomb dropped. And y'all, she was so gracious as were the people at the ceremony on the 6th where I got a cake and a birthday song. But 
I can't imagine. And, you know, I'm peace and love and joy and all this groovy stuff, but I can't imagine the depth of healing and emotional transformation and forgiveness that would allow for someone to be so gracious to someone from the U.S. who, you know, I was the oppressor for the first time in my life as a black woman from, you know, rural South, I was the oppressor. And I felt that wow. and it was a trip. And I couldn't imagine what it would take for folks to be as gracious and forgiving as those folks were. And I just wanted to share that because, you know, it was awesome, Susan, but it's a real buzzkill. Hard to what be is? uplifted by after your presentation, it's hard to feel really great. Oh, and I'm not uh, telling yeah. you people feel great, but we get there. We do the work. We stay in it. We stay conscious. We dismantle white supremacy and, you know, we'll get there. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you for both of those. That, that's, that's so true. Um, what you said about the depth of forgiveness. Yeah. Have, oh, go ahead. If you can see me, I'm just. Um, were there plans to bomb a third city if for some reason they had not on the first two? Um, there was potential plans, but a third one wasn't ready yet. All right. Now, what was the reason again why after the first one, the Japanese just didn't have enough time to be able to, to say, you know, we, we surrender or what was the issues that between the first and the second bombing? Well, just, uh, I don't know if I can, it's a very complicated question. Um, uh, and uh, they didn't even know for a week after each bombing, they sent a team of physicists down to figure out what the bomb was. They didn't know what it was. Um, and in Nagasaki, it took a week as well. Um, but, um, you know, at least some of the Japanese leaders didn't care about their people, you know, look, they'd already allowed 64 cities to be all or partially destroyed. But um, uh, the second bomb was not scheduled for another week. But because of um, weather forecasts for poor weather over Kyushu, um, they moved the time up a week. So I, I don't know if what would have happened if it had gone at the regular time, you know, Might which would have been 10 days after Hiroshima instead of three days. I had heard once that, that the Japanese had surrendered to the Russians, but the Russians didn't tell the Americans. Did you ever hear that or is this not, that's not correct? Uh, I have never heard that and I don't, I, I can't verify for sure unless there's some evidence I didn't see. Um, but according with the evidence that I saw um, back when I was doing the research, that that was not there. So when they did actually resign, who did they resign to? I mean, well, how... the emperor um, the emperor made the decision in the middle of the night in his bunker with all the cabinet around him, and then um, and then that message went out to. Uh, I'm afraid I don't quite remember, but that message went out to certain nations and then it got to the United States and then they had to do the final negotiations. In the meantime, we're still bombing Japan up until the day of surrender, until the, the day the surrender was um, signed, or not signed, official. We've come to the end of our time, August. everybody. Uh, yeah. Thank you again, Susan. We, we are at the end of our time and we have a special presentation here by uh, Vicky. Can you, you want to uh, be, be, uh, mute yourself and, or unmute yourself and uh, introduce this? Sure. Thank you, Joe. And thank you, George. And Susan, thank you so much. Um, it's hard to, to, uh, to even speak after hearing what you presented and not that we were unaware of it, but seeing it again so graphically uh, brought it into full color for us. Uh, I'm here today because I'm representing our local 
gaggle of raging grannies. And you may know, as, as some of you do, that we are part of an international network of older women. Um, some of us born in the 40s who have some memories, even if they may be dim, of what the world went through at that time. Um, but what we do is uh, write our own lyrics and set them to old familiar melodies so that we have an opportunity to speak our truth in a way that people will, will hear us. And um, so we've brought a song to you today that we actually wrote back in um, 2006. And I brought it with me when I moved to um, North Carolina. And um, we wanna sing it for you today. Um, the grannies have pre-recorded their song because we sometimes run into technical difficulties. So we uh, got together about a week ago and recorded this in, in your honor and in, um, um, in the honor of, of all of those who uh, perished and those who survived the, the tragic and unnecessary bombing in, in Nagasaki. So Joe, if you want to play that video, we'll- uh, I will we'll start it uh, momentarily. Uh, oh, folks may want to <laughs> save the chat if there's stuff you want in the chat. After the end of the music, I will end the meeting. On Hiroshima, Nagasaki, the atom bombs fell, and children playing in the sun burned in a living hell. Shadows of their bodies marked where they had stood, imprinted now into the ground of their own neighborhood. One moment they were playing, the next one they were dead, as fireballs and hellish heat across them quickly spread. Toddlers and babies, school-age kids as well, incinerated in the blast that few have lived to tell. Japanese survivors, still suffer the effects their children born who live with scorn from horrid birth defects radioactive fallout dropping from the sky in hiroshima nagasaki thousands more would die it's to our shame and sorrow that we're the only ones who've ever dropped an atom bomb and just what have we won they tell us god is on our side and that our way is right well when will we learn the simple truth that might does not make right it's time to put the bombs to rest just make them disappear so children living around the world no longer live in fear the threat of nuclear weapons must be gone forevermore so all the world can live in peace we demand an end to war Thank you, everyone. Take care. Mm. Good night. Very good music. Thank you. Thank you.